I'm Lee Swindishman and I have gluten ataxia. I want to create this video because I realized since being diagnosed in 2013, there still isn't enough information out there. So please join me as I share my journey, uh, what happened along the way with gluten ataxia, as well as information and resources. Thanks so much for joining me here. I realized that there hasn't been enough information out there about gluten ataxia. I was diagnosed at the end of 2013 and from then until now, there's still very limited information online. So as I share my journey with you, if you have questions, please leave them in the comments below because I can't get through everything about gluten ataxia in one video. There will most likely have to be a couple <laughs> or more. So uh, if I leave out anything, which I will, I will do it in another video. Please though, reach out to me because you have a question, someone else will as well. And if I can help in this community, that will mean the world to me. I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's in September 2011. I had actually started feeling really off, I'm gonna say around 2010. So 2010, 2009, I wasn't feeling great. And then all of a sudden it started to spiral. I thought I had a diagnosis of Hashimoto's and autoimmune disease, I'm like, I'm good. I do my homework, I'm gonna get this, no problem. I did everything you can imagine um, to bring my levels of inflammation down in my body. i very holistic in what I do. I was uh, told to go gluten-free, so I went gluten-free. I changed how I ate. I changed my mindset. I calmed my body down. No matter what I did, I got worse. And things hit a peak in 2013. I didn't realize that at the time there were a ton of warning signs, but uh, I just didn't think they were associated with anything else. I thought they had to do with Hashimoto's. So in 2013, funny enough, at a body image award night, my body fell apart. I found myself sighing really loudly. Um, it sounded exasperated. I sounded rude. I sounded... Um, like I was fed up with people. And looking back, it makes me uncomfortable because people had the wrong impression of me. The room felt boiling hot. It was started to spin. Um, I remember I had just had water that night and I had to take my shoes off because I was falling off my heels, trying to get back to my car. I could barely walk. It was like in one night, my body forgot how to do everything. And within two weeks, I was walking into walls, I was falling over, I couldn't walk properly, I couldn't talk properly. I was, f I remember trying to put on a sock and almost breaking my nose because I just plummeted to the floor. Things that I had just always done with ease all of a sudden um, were imploding. I couldn't get a spoon to my mouth or a fork to my mouth. I was worried about cutting myself with a knife because my hands were so jittery and unstable. I was burning myself by trying to eat food. So I stopped eating certain foods. Um, I started choking on food and having trouble swallowing. Within two weeks in September of 2013, I was in my early 40s and I literally thought I was headed to a nursing home. It was so severe. Um, my brain had actually, which more than anything scared me because I'd had so much brain fog with Hashimoto's, it was just amplifying. It, it was just like my brain was a sieve. Nothing could be retained. Um, I couldn't work, I couldn't function, I couldn't do anything. At the time, because I was slurring so much, I was stuttering, I was um, having so much trouble with communicating, I thought I might be in early stages of Parkinson's, I thought it might be um, ALS, like I didn't know what was happening. I My hands were shaking so much, I couldn't do up a button, a zipper, um, I couldn't put my shoes on, I couldn't at the time with my iPod get the cord in it. 
I couldn't get a cord in to a phone or an iPod at the time to put earphones in. I couldn't get an earphone into my ear. Nothing was working. Also at the time I had complete numbness from my elbows to my hands. They were either in excruciating pain, um, mixed in with tingling and numbness. It really depended on the day. Um, but looking back, my arms hadn't worked for the last couple years. I just again thought it was all Hashimoto's. Another thing that was happening at the time was for several years, I had excruciating pain in my face. So picture having a migraine, but in your face every day for years. And this side of my face was on fire and numb and feeling like a migraine and then this felt freezing cold numb so it felt like i had been to the dentist and had had this frozen um and then it was radiating pain and cooling it depended on the day of the week or the hour what was happening um and it was just this agony that i had to get used to because i had to live my life um, I didn't know at the time that this was all related to gluten ataxia. So my world imploded quickly while I was trying to work. The more I tried to do things, I tell people it was the equivalent of when you have an adrenaline surge, if you're in an accident scene and you see people lift a car off somebody, I was doing that every day until my body said I can't do it. I was doing a lot of on-air TV work where that's a lot of live television, it's a lot of adrenaline rush, it's a lot of remembering points. It's a, about being on on TV and uh, just thinking uh, off the top of your head and off the cuff. And I was doing that while trying to get a diagnosis. So I was live on air and I had no idea what I was doing because everything that I knew was falling apart. So if you wanna see someone do jazz hands and um, kind of just make stuff up on the fly, to this day, I'm proud of that, but it just created a mind fog that is so hard to explain that to someone who hasn't had it. And once you're in it, it's so hard to get out of it. What was also happening was now my lips I find are even when I'm talking. It was very lopsided for a long time. A lot of people didn't notice, I did. I didn't let it affect me, I kept doing things, but it'd be very tiring to talk. Um, it was very hard to talk and it was very hard to enunciate and keep, keep it even in my mouth while I was talking. So there was just so much going on I managed at the time to get a diagnosis of gluten ataxia in late, late December. And immediately I went on a paleo diet as recommended by my healthcare practitioner. Because of Hashimoto's, I had been gluten free, but I hadn't been celiac safe gluten free. When I was with Hashimoto's and being gluten free, I was doing things like not worrying about cross contamination. I was not going out and having bread or beer or anything like that, but I wasn't as meticulous and as attention to detail as you have to be now with gluten ataxia, celiac and everything like that falls under the spectrum there. Um, so I wasn't gluten free enough and I was still getting a lot that was affecting my brain and nervous system. So when I went paleo within three weeks, I felt so much better. Uh, a lot of the agony and pain that I'd been in every day for years went away. I had stomach pains for years and it went away. To this day, I do not know 100% if I have celiac. I have to assume that I also have celiac as well. Any of the glutenings I've had, I haven't had a stomach reaction. Now, I know you can still damage your villi and you can still have celiac disease and have something and not feel anything and it still be detrimental to your health, um, to your villi. I understand that. My uh, reaction is neurological. Uh, my reaction is my nervous system. It's not to say that that won't change in the future, but for now, that's what's been happening uh, the few times that I've unfortunately been glutened over the last few years. 
and I like to keep it to a minimum. <laughs> it hasn't been a lot of times and I want to keep it that way. Looking back now, I realized that there were warning signs that I wasn't seeing months and years ahead of time. For 10 years, I had excruciating headaches to the point where a lot of times I would be in my bed with no stimulus whatsoever in a darkened room with my eye welded shut with tears pouring down it, excruciating headache, feeling like I was going to throw up, sometimes several days to up to a week. And I would try to go for massage therapy. I would try to go to the osteopath to try to, um, you know, just calm down my body. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. It usually happened when there was a thunderstorm. So I always thought I had barometric pressure headaches. And for 10 years, this went on. Like every couple of months, I'd have an excruciating headache and I chalked it up to the weather. My arms uh, continuously got weaker and weaker. So for several years before, I just chalked it up to Hashimoto's. And when my hands would tremble all the time, I'd say, oh, I'm weak, my blood sugar's still off because of Hashimoto's, even though I was eating regularly to heal my body. It just, I had no strength. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't, I couldn't lift myself up off a chair. I had to come up with ways to um, get out of a chair that would involve me pushing my body forward and using the the size of my head to propel myself off something as a weight or to bounce off a wall because I couldn't get up anymore I just put everything um, to Hashimoto's and for years um, I just thought it was that earlier in 2013 I was trying to do some rehabilitative uh, fitness work. I couldn't do a push up. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move quickly. And the quicker I would move or I'd have to think about something, the more my body would shut down. And earlier in the year as well, I had an episode in April of that year where I fell over at an event and I started slurring. And I didn't fall over very much, like I stumbled but it came upon me as quickly as it left. So within an hour, I was normal again. I'm like, what was that? And I pushed it to the side till all of a sudden, <laughs> by the end of the year, my body's like, no, we can't push it aside anymore and we can't suppress it and it's here. In 2011, I had been training for my first 5K and while I was on the treadmill, I lost all energy, flew off the treadmill, smashed into the wall and that was the last time I was ever able to jog. And I look forward to being able to do it again. I will do it again. I'm just not sure when. <laughs> but at that time, again, when I got my Hashimoto's diagnosis, I chalked everything up to that. But I also had an episode of vertigo on the treadmill, which is the worst experience, um, which now I realize for me, vertigo was also an early sign of gluten ataxia. So for those of you that don't know what causes gluten ataxia, basically when we ingest gluten, it causes an attack on the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum, which is in the back of the brain. And it controls your walking, your talking, your nervous system. It controls a lot of things. And in a nutshell, when it's not working properly, I look like I was drunk. And unfortunately to this day, even though I look completely um, slur free right now, I'm moving my hands. If I overstimulate my body, if I overstimulate my brain, if I try to do uh, an, an amount of exercise, exercise I can't do, my body will shut down. So it's going in and out of ability several times a week. And if I push myself, um, and get those endorphins going with exercise a little bit, my body shuts down. So it's taken years to get to this point. It's taken years to be able to think and talk clearly right now, move my arms all at the same time and talk to you. One really big problem with ataxia is that I had nystigmus. And nystigmus is basically that your eyes are jittering and for me, my pupils were dilating so much and my eyes were um, moving up and down. So picture yourself standing on a vibrating platform and you're looking at the whole world like that. So every day I had that happening 
balance issues like somebody who had had too many drinks on a boat while standing on a vibrating plate while trying to walk and while brain fog is setting in and you're trying to think and you can't remember anything. And I had severe blood sugar issues which were also causing me to be 10 times more jittery than I would have been with just the ataxia. Um, on top of that, I had inner body tremoring. So it was this like improper adrenal response. It took so long to correct this and there were so many phases where it was going either when I'd wake up in the morning, sometimes 24 seven. So I tell people it was the feeling of having 20 cell phones inside your body vibrating and buzzing and it is the worst feeling, it is maddening. And one of the worst things that happened was I would wake up every morning and it could be, it could be anything from like a bird making a little chirping noise outside would terrify my entire nervous system because my cortisol levels were off, my adrenaline was off, everything was off. So my body would go into this fight or flight mode. And because I've meditated so much in my life, I would literally lie in bed and tell myself, your body is experiencing terror, but it is not real. You have heard something and your nervous system is reacting, but it is a stimulus to your body, it is not real. My body felt that even though my soul and my brain knew it wasn't anything, it was a bird chirping, it's not scary, but my body was still reacting with terror and the body buzzing would amplify and the shaking would amplify. So depending on what period it was, sometimes it could take me up to two hours in the morning to calm my body down from something as simple as a bird chirping as crazy as that is. And the outside stimulus became so overwhelming. That's one of the things I realized now with me for gluten ataxia is noise is amplified, colors are amplified. So for a long time when I had energy to go outside, sometimes I could only get around the block, I would have to put earphones in and listen to ocean waves because a car going by with a street guard going by, that was a flash of color, it was a flash of noise, and the more information my brain had to take in, the more painful things became. So one of my favorite places to go is grocery shopping. I love grocery shopping. I think it's meditative and fun and I just love checking out new products. Grocery shopping was stimulus overload. It was, if you go into a grocery store and you realize how many colors are everywhere and how many pieces of information there are, and then I would try to walk on top of it it just became sensory overload, grocery shopping, sensory overload. So even on my healing journey, as my walking got better and better, that is still one place that can take me down if I do too much in a week because there's too many colors. There could be music playing, there could be someone talking in the loudspeaker, um, there's people moving. It's a lot of information and my brain did better when things were a solid color. So if I'm in my house and there are just plain walls without a lot of art or without a lot of stimulus, a lot of noise, my brain can handle it better. If I was in a restaurant, that would be one of the worst places as well. Now I can hear a din in a room pretty much as one noise. Before, if say there were a hundred people in the restaurant, I would hear all the conversations isolated and it would be excruciatingly painful. I would find myself focusing, if there was a white plate in front of me, it was a plain color, and I would find myself staring at the plate, trying to center myself. And people would say, you know, are you okay? But that was a way to look at a solid color and calm my brain down and calm the information coming in. Luckily, over the years, I've been super, super extra careful and diligent about cross-contamination and um, being so, so good with what I eat and how things are prepared, but the odd time things have happened. Um, luckily, I've only been gluten a few times, and what I wanna make clear is I look at the research by Dr. I'm uh, sorry, Professor uh, Marius Havasulu, and I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly. I'll, I'll leave his information below. But 
As far as I'm concerned, he is one of the leading experts, if not the leading expert on gluten ataxia in the world. And he says that, you know, there's a greater chance with um, celiac for your villi in your stomach to heal versus your brain healing every time you get glutened. So I take that very seriously. It's taking me, it feels like 10 years to be able to think and talk and articulate now and have energy again and keep building it up. I don't want to go backwards. So, you know, if it means people want to go to a restaurant and I'm not sure about the food, I'm going to eat everything ahead of time in order to go out and have a good time and have a drink and maybe just something that's super safe, like a small salad, if I know that's going to be a super safe food, if we can't go to a gluten-free establishment. I, I don't take chances. I don't play Russian roulette with anything. If I don't know, I grab a protein bar. I always have my protein bar. The few times I have got glutened was once I accidentally had farro in something and I thought it was sliced almonds. Uh, I didn't know what farro was, but luckily I realized quickly and didn't ingest anything. Um, but what I do realize with me with gluten ataxia is there is one odd gift in this. I haven't gotten to the point where I've eaten a big mouthful of something not knowing it's got gluten in it. That one time with farro, it was in my mouth, but I didn't digest it. My mouth went freezing cold again. It's like the nerve damage here all of a sudden just shot up. So I call that my early warning sign that is a gift in a very weird way that my mouth will go numb. And that's my sign that tells me that <laughs> stop eating right now and change course. Another thing that severely affected me was my, um, my sister's family has a dog and I was super careful with her food. I didn't touch it. I knew it had a little bit of gluten in it. I was getting severely glutened by the dust from the food going up in the air and I had no idea. For so many people with gluten related issues, I've heard that they can go dark and depressed very fast. The speed in which this affected my mood was unbelievable. I didn't know what was happening and I would, I could be outright crying in a few minutes after feeding this dog food and I am a happy go lucky person. I'm like, what is happening? Thankfully, one day I had my glasses on top of my head and I had taken a scoop and I had been very careful, super careful, washed my hands, didn't touch it whatsoever. And I saw a fine powder all over the glasses. It had wafted up from the bowl to my glasses. So I had inhaled it like a flower if you went to a pizza parlor or something like that. From that point on, I stayed clear. We changed the dog food. So I did not obviously eat any dog food, but just that powder in the air severely affected me and affected me so much to the point where I was sobbing. It had affected my mood so much just from inhaling a little bit of it. Another time I was at a hair salon and I had my hair shampooed and something was going severely wrong. As I was getting my hair blow dried, the blow dryer sound was amplifying. Going in and out with the blow dryer, it felt like a truck was coming at me. Within an hour of starting from getting my hair washed to walking the couple blocks home, I was crawling in my front door. I was almost throwing up. The room was spinning. I had to crawl up the stairs. I took three showers, I think that night. I kept running out till there was no more hot water and I washed my hair so many times. And it turned out that hydrolyzed wheat protein in the shampoo and the conditioner had that much effect on me. So since that day, I've been extra, extra careful to stay clear of hydrolyzed wheat protein. And I had a career for a long time as a plus model and on television. So we wore a lot of hair and makeup. So that dramatically not just changed my health, it changed my entire career. All of a sudden there are so many things that I couldn't eat, I couldn't use on my body. I had to rethink everything from my skincare to my hair care, um, to my entire career because hair and makeup artists will show up with an entire kit and I wasn't comfortable having a lipstick or a lip gloss used on me and I didn't know what was in it. So I had to pull back from everything. 
So just know that a gluten reaction does not have to involve your gut. For me, it's been neurological, it's been nervous system related, and it's also been stress related. I say uh, any autoimmunity and gluten ataxia especially is like trying to appease a sleeping giant. Um, when the giant's asleep, it's good. And you don't want to wake up the giant. You want to like, stay sleeping, stay sleeping. So when anything super stressful happens, it just really affects the entire nervous system. It affects the brain. So I've had, um, unfortunately in early 2018, a car accident. And after that, my body was shocked and I was having trouble walking. And it takes quite a while for my body to get back to normal. I had another major stressful incident that year and right after that uh, my body again did not know how to walk properly and everything just feels like you're putting your brain and your body in a blender. So the more I can do to lead a mindful life to eat and keep sugars down that has been huge for me over the years and strictly strictly gluten free and paleo and keeping sugars down. I find that when I eliminated a lot of those sugars that can be found in breads, even gluten-free breads, breads, rice, any kind of grains, it just helps my body function so much better. This isn't to say that's for everybody, but um, if I could give anything that that would be one piece of advice is, in my mind, every meal is a gift to heal and one of my biggest medicines and all of this has been how I eat and I love my treats and I love my desserts I just do them differently now so I make things and they just use coconut flour instead or I might use a natural sweetener like maple syrup so I still have fun I just have to do them a little differently that's all when I got diagnosed at the end of 2013, I thought, okay, good. I'm gonna do all my homework. I'm gonna do little physio um, exercises at home. I've gone strictly, strictly, strictly celiac safe, gluten-free. I've gone paleo. Um, I felt like I was doing all my homework. So things got better for a little bit. I would go in phases of one day I could do a TV show and talk normally and wear heels and be on it but then I couldn't. And it was like pushing, pushing, pushing <laughs> that sleeping giant and the giant was upset with me. So after a while into 2014, it just wasn't working anymore. I had been using up all my adrenaline reserves and things were just shutting down. I knew I needed more help. I looked into lots of physio programs and I live in Toronto, Canada, and I found one that, <sighs> really looked like it was what I needed and it was in Los Angeles, California. So I looked into physiotherapy with NeuroFit in Los Angeles, California and made the decision to go there for three months. I was unable to work at the time. I was unable to have conversations more than 20 minutes a day. I could barely walk, I could barely talk and things just were getting worse. One of the things that really made me realize that I needed help, and people say this is not related to gluten ataxia, but I've never done it before and I've never done it since. I was shutting down to the point where I was stuck at home so much, I felt like I was in isolation. Um, I couldn't watch TV, I couldn't use my computer, I couldn't read a book. There were days and days and days on end where I would sit in the dark and stare at a wall because the world was spinning, the world was too noisy, the world was too loud, too bright, everything. I was like, I need help or I'm going to lose my house because I can't work. And I found Neurofit Systems in California and I decided to go. Because one day I went to the kitchen and I realized I had lined up pens, three pens in a row, in a meticulous row. And I came back and I'm like, what did you just do? You just lined up pens. And I know people say, oh, that is not related to gluten ataxia, but this is what I knew in my heart at that moment. I knew that, here's my analogy. Say if you broke your leg and you set it yourself and you put it in a cast yourself, it's not gonna set properly. I knew I was having a ripple of all kinds of things happening because I was doing the best I knew how to do to reset my brain and body, 
but it wasn't good enough. I was basically putting a broken leg in a cast and trying to do a marathon and causing all kinds of ripples of problems. So when I stared at those three pens, which sound like they're not related whatsoever to glutenataxia, I knew my brain was resetting improperly. I knew that there were ripples of things that didn't make sense and I needed help. And I never did it after physiotherapy ever again, and I had never done it before. So I knew in my cast, my broken leg, so to speak, I was resetting things wrong and I needed help. Before I went away, I got uh, an appointment with a neurologist uh, just to double check as I had got my glutenataxia outside of traditional healthcare through a company called Cyrix Labs. And I will leave the information in the comments below so you can find it. The test for glutenataxia is called transglutaminase 6. So I will leave that below for you. That's important because a lot of people, neurologists or ataxia or even a ataxia specialist or even people that do physiotherapy have not heard of glutenataxia. So I went to the neurologist and they had never heard of it and they basically said, good luck to me. I got on a plane and I went to get some help. Physiotherapy for my glutenataxia was the best thing I have ever done. I didn't realize until I tried to do a lot of moves uh, that I had lost so many motor skills. It was a disconnect from my brain to my hand. If I wanted my hand to do something, at the time it was still numb. So from my elbows through to my hands, it was aching, it was painful, it was numb, it was tingling. I couldn't feel anything. But even trying to type, things like that, I could feel my brain trying to tell my hand to do something and it didn't know how. It was like if there was an invisible string or an invisible messaging system to your limbs, it was completely cut off. My brain wasn't telling the messaging to my body parts. At the time, I had um, neuropathy in my legs too. So from my elbows through to my hands and from my knees down, it felt like pins and needles all the time. Um, my legs would come and go, for, but for many years I had neuropathy and thankfully it's gone away. But that was a big part of it. So going through this amazing program, I cannot say enough about, about NeuroFit, but going through this amazing program, it taught my brain how to send messaging again. It reconnected all those invisible dots that we just take for granted. Um, but it also made me understand that there are so many factors that are the same. I'm not saying that everyone's journey is the same, but when I was in there with people with PTSD, with children with autism, with other people with ataxias, people who had strokes, you could see how much the brain and the body changes with different things that have happened um, and different experiences and different health problems and how similar a lot of our, our responses were and getting that neuroplasticity back. So I met some beautiful people and a lot of times I would be in physiotherapy with these beautiful children. And uh, one girl was my favorite because every time I went, she would just laugh at me because she saw me grunting and I'd look forward to her making fun of me. It became a fun part of therapy. But literally every week for uh, three months, the progress and um, the skills that were built up back in my brain and my body and my nervous system were unbelievable. As I'm filming this in early 2021, I realized that there is so much progress I have made and I'm so grateful for where I have come from. Um, it's been a work in progress every single day since, <laughs> like before I even knew I had gluten ataxia. There's so much more that I could cover. I would like to talk to you more about my physiotherapy and show you some videos, uh, but I'm gonna put that in another video for you. So please, if you have questions, put those questions in the comments below. And what I'd love to do is put those all together and do another video, share some more information, share my physiotherapy videos, and break down more that I realize I probably haven't shared in here, because once I watch this video, I'm gonna think of so many more things to be able to tell you um, and to break down. There's just so much to cover. So please, if you have a question, 
Especially, I want to put this out to parents that when you have children with gluten ataxia, I'm an adult and there are so many things that came across as an emotional response and they weren't. They were system overload response. So if your child is doing something and it's related to gluten, please ask me because this adult brain can explain what is going on and how they're reacting. If they're too young to know how to articulate it, I'd love to be able to explain it to you. Because so many times I've had outbursts or things happen that look like they're an emotional response and they're not. They're like a kettle steaming and exploding because it's got nowhere else to go. So please, if you have questions, if you have comments, leave them below. I will be making more videos for you because when I started this in 2013, this journey with gluten ataxia, there was barely any information out there. And in 2021, there is still barely any information out there. For years, I was the only person on Instagram with the hashtag gluten ataxia, which at one point made me sad because I had nobody in the room to talk to. But on the other point, it was a club. I didn't want anybody to have to join. So I hear you, you're not alone. And if I can help in any way at all, please let me know. Um, I would be more than happy to do that. All right, thanks. I'm so happy to have you here and I'm looking forward to meeting you um, in the comments below and helping in any way I can.